We have a scholar named Martin Note, N-O-T-H. I have him back here, Martin Note. He followed Gunkel. Gunkel wrote his Schopfung und Chaos, uh, which is creation and chaos, that uh, I mentioned just in the last uh, segment. Martin Note, very famous. His work on the traditions about the 12 tribes in Israel. Oh, I remember this in school. And Kurt Galling, G-A-L-L-I-N-G, his study of the two situations where God chose Israel as a nation. These are traditions that these people are studying. The call of Abraham was also Galling's, and the deliverance from Egyptian bondage are leading examples of this method at work. So you take one of these themes and you write it to death. You come up with a big fat book. Note had a history of Israel. And his history of Israel had a lot of this in it. And you know, once they get onto something, it's like a June bug and a peach. A June bug sticks to that peach and won't let it go. And that's the kind of thing that they do. A tremendous impetus was given to this uh, kind of uh, oral tradition. Uh, I don't even want to try to write this word on the board, but if you've got to see it once, You've got to see it, I suppose. It's the word for tradition history. This is a real killer, so get your pencil, pencils ready. Pencils. Who uses a pencil anymore? I think I can still write it. That's right. Überlieferungsgeschichte. If you can write this, you can go to the head of the class. I think that's it. That's a long word. That's even longer than watermelon. So um, I would expect uh, that if you can write that one, that's the thing. Tradition history. And this was cooked up by Scandinavian scholars. Now the Swedes are getting involved. Notably, Johannes Lindblom, L-I-N-D-B-L-O-M, Ivan Engnell, E-N-G-N-E-L-L, -E -L -L, and Sigmund Movinkel, M-O-W-I-N-C-K-E-L, in the years between the World Wars. Realize now, with World War I, the war to end all wars, the whole world was put into considerable shock of the horrors of World War I. And scholars were scratching for ways to try to explain um, how God could have let this sort of thing happen in their minds, you know. So that period between the wars, they didn't know it, but they were heading for World War II and more trouble. So, one thing they did in this period was turning much of their attention toward the prophets rather than the Pentateuch with all its laws and so forth. In their hands, form criticism became not merely the analysis of literary form, but more specifically the study of the formation of literature from oral tradition. So it's getting more complicated. They sought to describe the cultural context or milieu, M-I-L-I-E-U, another term that's used a lot along with genre and milieu, by that we mean context and cultural context in this case, but you can say a milieu for almost anything, in which the prophetic literature originated and developed. Now, develop is the word I use. Develop through time is the word I use in place of evolution. But it's the same kind of thing. They posited associations of ecstatic cult prophets, not unlike the prophets of Baal. Think 1 Kings 18. We're back, see, knocking on the doors of comparative religion. Who attached themselves, these prophets did, to various shrines and holy places. Sounds like Hinduism to me. Who wrote Isaiah, for example? Well, there may be a genuine Isianic huh, Isaiah with a, well, I-S-A-I-N-I-C, with an Isianic nucleus to the book of that name, but much preserving of the prophet's message was done by 
his devoted followers at a time perhaps long after the prophet's death. Isaiah then came from the Isianic school. He didn't write it, or if he wrote some of it, a whole lot was added by others. Now you've got quite a deal. As we'll turn out, you might actually know about this. Um, it was in, in case of Isaiah. Isaiah himself did 1 to 39. Uh, Isaiah, that would be called Isaiah 1. The second Isaiah, one of these uh, followers and associates, did 40 to 55, 6, 55, right in there. And then there's the third Isaiah, who did 56 to 66. I might be off just one there. But that makes for three Isaiahs. And what kind of um, book is the Old Testament anyway if they have one Isaiah doing the talking and yet this was all, parts of it were all done later. Why the later? Well, they don't accept um, prophecy. There's no prophecy in their minds. It's all history. So you've got to take this out to other groups. So this would be the time of Isaiah. This would be the time of the Babylonian period in Israel's history, and this would be the Persian period. So you see, they stream stretched the book all out over places that it wasn't intended to go, other than prophetically. You can, you can prophesy, as Isaiah did, about Cyrus the Persian, and that's glorious prophecy, but they're making it all into history. I've lived with this for a long time. So, this is one of the results then of putting into practice Gunkel's suggestion that if the nature of the Old Testament literature was to be understood, the study of literary types must be supplemented with an investigation through the lens of comparative religion, always, of the cultural context from which each type had sprung. I've seen that carried out in New Testament studies too. People talk, well, that such and such couldn't have happened because of the cultural period or they they throw out some kind of cultural period and then try to make the Bible add up to it. And uh, history is not history with some of these people. An example of tradition criticism might be done this way. This is really good. By taking the crossing of the Red Sea tradition and tracing its formulations and functions at several junctures of biblical letters, for example, one might sketch a history of the interpretation of or understandings given to that early episode of the epic story of ancient Israel. Let's cross the Red Sea. Hmm. How did the Old Testament source we call J use and understand it? Let's see, they're still back there asking these kind of questions. The JEDP, that engine that drives this whole thing, has not gone away. Why did the one we call P apparently conjoin it with the Exodus event rather than with the wilderness tradition? These people sound so mixed up. But this is very scholarly. At what point in Israel's theological, political, and cultic history did the tradition of crossing the Reed Sea, notice they have R-E-E-D, they don't take the Red Sea literally, the whole Reed Sea is like they went across the Bitter Lakes or they went across some place there in the, what we'd call today, the line between Sinai and Egypt. Uh, crossing the Reed Sea out of Egypt become typologically related Ooh, to the tradition of crossing the Jordan into Canaan. Now they got their crossings crossed up because they're going to mix in the tradition of the Reed Sea or the Red Sea and the crossing of the Jordan a little later in the book of Joshua. So, at this point we want to say, how do the several early poems and psalms which mention the Reed Sea crossing use it? What function does such a tradition have in the prophets? And that's where we'll leave this section right here, because we want to ask that question. What function does such a tradition have to do, have in the prophets? So we're going to trace that through. Mm -hmm.